Hello, hello, hello. Is this good, Josh? Thanks, Josh. Hey, my good friend Josh Keppel, who I've known since the mid '90s from Eureka, California, is here filming. Thanks, babe. <laughs> and he also is the camera guy for the introductory in interview of Andy and Alan. Should I do intros or? Yeah, yeah please do. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Kenneth Thomas. <laughs> I'm the, I'm the produce, producer, director, editor, camera operator, sound mixer, color corrector of this movie. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was truly a labor of love and obsession and mania at times. <laughs> but it was beautiful mania. So here on stage is Wendy, who owned the store. Wendy, do you own the store? Wendy, do you own the store, Wendy? In what, from what years? I started there in 89, uh, right before the earthquake, and oh, okay. loved it in 03, and then I moved to Okay. And then we have Andy and Alan, who, uh, who you guys know. And you had it from 2003 to 2016, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right, there's the intros. <laughs> How did you decide who you wanted to interview for this? There's so many great interviews. Like, you must have, did you, did you have a big list of people go after? Like, how would that work out? Yeah. Um, is it okay if I sit, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, actually, the, the number of interviews in this documentary is of somewhere between 60 and 65, but I interviewed over 100 people for this. And that includes just sort of like people in the store, just, hey, can I talk to you about what records you're buying? Like, that sort of thing. Why'd you buy those? That sort of thing. And then I was just editing and I was just like, I really want to put everybody in there, but I had to narrow it down because otherwise it would be like a five hour movie. <laughs> um, so I basically talked to Andy, Alan, and Wendy and got their advice about who to interview. And of course, all the previous owners was a no brainer. And then Wendy, Alan, and Andy hooked me up with emails and phone numbers of people literally all over the world to talk to. Um, so John Darnell, the guy from the Mountain Goats, you know, I guess he was telling the story about how he connected with you at first, and so that was definitely a must, and he happened to be playing at the Swedish American Hall, like, like I don't know, within two weeks of you telling me about it. Like, you should talk to John Darnell. I was like, oh, he's playing in February. Yes, and me. then Andy went on tour in, with one of his epic bands in, two, in the summer of 2016, so I went with him. And we were in Finland, Sweden, and Norway, and we interviewed a whole bunch of people, several of whom you had never met before, but only through email. But um, but people that, that we needed to talk to because like that the second those last two guys from Norway, Turie and Tom Henry Olsen, those are like I think like the top two or in the top five um, record buyers at Aquarius Records. In fact, I, I think it's safe to say that Tom Henry Olsen bought over $100,000 worth of records from Aquarius Records. And he lives in a suburb of Oslo, Norway. Wow. So I had to interview him. Apparently, 140 or 40. Holy cats. He would order every, every two weeks when the list would come out. He would always wait, but, oh, where's Tom's? Or maybe one of the first. Yeah. And it would be all of the ones. So it was pretty nice. Pretty nice. Yeah. yeah, and I asked him, I was just like, so do you listen to all these things? And he's like, well, that's a very, uh, this is my Norwegian impression. I'm bad at this stuff. That is a very strange question. And I was just like, why is that? And he's like, would you ask a librarian if they've read every book in the library? And that's all I answered him. Yeah, for us it was good too, because we've been calling Terry Turge for like five years. Oh yeah, Ter when we saw him, we were like, Turge! And he's like, it's Terry. I was like, oh, shit, sorry. <laughs> how was it for you guys having this, this camera there during this whole process? And like, how was that? How was it feeling to be documented during this period? Uh, I would say, honestly, I was probably more concerned with trying to either keep the store going or selling the store in the end. It wasn't really like a big thing I was thinking about. I thought, oh, this is great. The camera wants to make this documentary, but. Um, uh, yeah, it wasn't. It, it was a fun to have them there, but it, but yeah. Uh, most of the time, Ken was kind of hanging out anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, realistically, like he came to every uh, record store day and every party we had, and he 
probably, he probably would have been there anyway. He just happened to be filming. Yeah. I think it got weirder when, when the store actually closed. And I think I told, like, I joked really early on. I said something like, you know, for this movie to be any good, it has to have a really dramatic ending, like the store's going to have to close or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and that, um, did we have to do red? But I, I didn't do that. Was just, it wasn't really on our ra radar because we were so busy like running the store and just trying to keep things going. But then when we actually had to talk about stuff, and he, you know, he, we were, I was in Europe and Alan was having to handle all the record closing business, and I was having to talk to him on a shitty cell phone and try to like process this all, but also play shows and drive ten hours a day. So it was really that stuff that made it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, I'm not a big fan of talking to people and encouraging sadness. And I wasn't trying to encourage sadness, but, you know, when you're talking about a sad subject, it's something that's just going to happen. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a little depressing to watch some of this, but at the same time, it also just left me feeling very fortunate and lucky to be part of, of the history of the store and to mainly, you know, to have met so many people, many of whom aren't even in the film. You interview tons of people, but there's like lots of other folks that could have been as well and it's just like so many good friends in there. Yeah. Any comments or questions from you all? Well first I would like to say real quick um, Penny Hoyle who is the Aquarius manager in the late 70s she's here she was yeah. interviewing the doc. You want to stand up Penny? Bush, Bush Bridges who owned the store in the 80s and yeah. yeah, he was involved with 415 Records she's here. Bruce Ackley, Bruce Ackley. You guys know Bruce. Dr. Saxophone. Woo! Uh, so, so if you guys have any questions about the old stuff, they're here and can answer them from back there. But feel free to ask whatever you want. Anyone? Or a comment is also on. Did you like the movie? Yeah. Thank you. Oh man, I should, I should have written down some stuff. Uh, there were. I'm kind of sad you didn't put more of the me and you see in the river. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. The thing it with took us like, it took us like 25 minutes to get in the river because it was so cold. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the scene with Andy and Yusi from Circle in the river. We were in Finland, and Yusi, I forget it was Yusi or Andy, said. Let's do the interview in the river. It will be like uh, Spiderland by that group Slint. So, you know, if you know the cover of that album, that's what we were trying to emulate. <laughs> and uh, and so, uh, so, so it's a little Easter egg for you. But um, but yeah, they, they were in that river for at least a half hour because it was like freezing cold, and I only used like twenty seconds of it. So I'm sorry. <laughs> that's definitely one thing I would have liked to use more of, but. Um, I feel like Circle needs their own documentary, and that's where I can use more of that for sure. There actually is a really great Circle documentary that a former employee of Aquarius made on YouTube. Oh, shit. Yes. Um, yeah. I would like to point out that there is a bunch of uh, former employees who you just got glimpses of, but who are super rad and yeah. define the story. Like Erwin popped up a few times. Uh, you know, Scott. <laughs> Kirk is here. Kirk is here, yeah. Kirk, yeah. <laughs> and Sydney. Sydney's here. Sydney, yeah. I got an interview with Sydney. So I, I, there is so much stuff to put in there. There's, I, I wanted to have as many Aquarius employees in there as I could, and it was just like. But just, you know, a store like Aquarius is like 95% about the employees. So yeah. we were very, very lucky to work with the people we did. Yeah. Used, so. yeah. I do see a hand in the back. Yeah. I just wanted to say that uh, it was great, yeah, thanks. Oh, thanks, Bruce. Great. And um, you know, the interesting thing about it, about Aquarius is that it kind of spans the time from when all music that was available was was corporate, really, except for maybe some fringe labels. Uh, but I'm thinking about when I first started shopping in Aquarius in 1971 and then started working there in 73, it was all from you know, major labels, because that's all there was. Uh, and people talked about music like, what are you into? I'm into classical, I'm into jazz, I like rock. That that all disappeared. Um, 
you know, because toward the end of the 70s, or even the middle of the 70s, all the DIY jazz labels happened, and punk labels happened, people were making their own music, and people were into everything, you know, starting in the early punk days where everybody was into not only punk and rock, but rockabilly and reggae, and all the genres were cross. <coughs> and so now we're at a time where none of those, you know, kind of dividing lines exist anymore, and people have access in a way that they never have had before. So it's just interesting that, you know, if you think about the beginning of Aquarius to now, it kind of spans that real cultural change. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. And that's one thing I, I, that sort of I loved about Aquarius when I discovered it in like the, the late 90s was like being exposed to all these things that like weren't on major labels, similar to what you said. Like, oh my God, there's other stuff out there? Yeah. A lot oh, this we, is so cool. A lot of what we sold was direct from the artists who often would be an Aquarius customer would say, oh yeah, you should check out, you know, the CDR that they made or something. And we get it. You, you check them out. Well, I think a lot of people who've talked to us over the years know that we had this sort of, we would always talk about the ideal, not the ideal Aquarius customer, but like the, the dream Aquarius customer would come in to buy a metal record, but would then also somehow lead with like the new Bell and Sebastian and also an Autech record. Or like the opposite, they'll come in to buy some weird techno thing and they'll buy a Leviathan record. And that was always like super, super, even until the end, it was super exciting to have people willing to trust us enough to try something that they wouldn't normally listen to. Yeah, that's sort of how I run my film festivals. It was yeah. the same idea. Yeah. So they come for one thing, but maybe we'll see this other thing. Like discovery, it's all about discovery. Yeah. So the, your record store was just about, just like that. Uh, anyone else? Yes, on um, the aisle. Um, speaking of discovery, uh, for each of you, what's a record you recommend right now? <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's tough. Um, I, oh, shit. <laughs> so I still buy an enormous amount of records. If you follow me on Bandcamp, you're either impressed or mortified. Um, <laughs> I, I just I my players. Um, sort of keeping the bird. Uh, Matt Green was talking about slow down bird song. I just bought this, and in keeping with the fact that there's still people doing Aquarius kind of stuff, I just bought a quadruple CD of processed. Each four CDs, an hour, I think an hour each, each one, with slightly different processed bird songs. <laughs> wow. Which is really great. It's like, it's structured as like a classical record, but it's like just sample bird songs. So you'll, you'll find this in your bird song section, you know? <laughs> <laughs> if I actually organize my records, yes. What's it called? Uh, I'm working on it. Give me some. <laughs> Which is the kind of record that had to come out in the late 90s, like maybe like a Karen Dalton kind of thing, like a little bit off and a little bit weird, and we would have championed it and it wouldn't have won a Grammy, but like somehow the way the music industry works now is strange and word kind of spreads like wildfire in the internet. And so she released this record that sounds like it should have been really obscure. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, it's so beautiful, yeah. Sure. You know the record? <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, and, and she won her Grammy for best whatever emerging artist or something. It's crazy to me. Anyway. Yeah, not all that time to think about it. Uh, hmm. It's a tough question to me. Yeah. Is I still you know listen to so much music? Uh, just okay. So today in the mail I got three CDs from Forced Exposure, and one of them was uh, Hastings in Malawi, which is like a sort of Nurse with Wound related project from the early 80s. They just got reissued on uh, Clan Gallery. Why are you looking at me? I don't know, in case you might know what I'm talking about. Give <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> some kind of feedback. Uh, and then a couple other, other things. Oh, like I wasn't listening. Yeah, no, I know. So yeah, that's, that's my new. Um, by the way, that bird thing is uh, the artist is Anton Bruhin. It's a quadruple CD. I also want to add another one to my uh, <laughs> Aquarius style. It'd be here for a while now. Uh, <laughs> there's also this artist called Zimoon, Z I M O U N, and he just came out with a record called uh, Guitar Studies, and also very Aquarius, where it's 
basically concocted these mechanisms where there's like little balls attached to strings and the guitars sort of play themselves and they create these really beautiful kind of like sun-like guitar scapes. So I recommend that one too. Hey, see, that's a, that's a perfect example, I think, of like why Squares is so awesome. I knew you learned that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just like, if you walked into like what, what Pete Majors and, uh, and, and Liz Harris and Grouper said, the Urban Outfitters and happen to see that record, which probably wouldn't be there in the first place. But, and look at it, be like, this sounds, we might say, that sounds weird, whatever, and you would go on to the next thing. But if you go to a place like Aquarius, they can put it in context for you, and then you'll get a chance to be like, oh wow, this is opening a little door in my brain that I didn't even know was there. And that's what it always felt like for me to happen to me countless times there. But I also like that you put the part in which Justin talked about us like conning and dividing records. Oh, yeah, the guy talking about the Swedish. He's just a fool. He's an idiot. I heard someone say that. They're like, this is a great record. But I was going to say, like, I think for us, enthusiasm went a long way. Like, I've been accused of saying that every record I've ever loved is my all time favorite record. Yeah. Which is kind of. Like, shout out the devil. <laughs> so, we actually have another show in here in like five minutes, so we have to wrap up. Okay. But did, that, did you say that there's an after thing? Oh, yes. So, after party <laughs> at the Sycamore. You guys know the Sycamore? It's on Mission. It's on the corner of Mission and Sycamore, which is Josh. It's between 17th and 18th, right? Yeah. 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 The Sycamore. Uh, for some reason, because it's not on a numbered street, it always gets thrown off. But it's on Mission between 17th and 18th, two block walk, piece of cake. Um, we have blue wrist, a uh, limited supply of blue wristbands. Uh, Christine, my lovely wife, who also wrote a little bit of the score for the film in the 70s disco era. There's a little, there's a little Georgia Lord in that song in the background. That's actually her. Um, uh, thanks, babe. Um, so she's got some blue wristbands, so we'll go out on the sidewalk where it's less crowded, and uh, we'll give them to you, and that will let you go to the Sycamore and hang out with us on the back patio, which we have reserved for us. And we're going to head there after this. Thank you. And really, thank you, everyone, for caring about it. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. <laughs>